Thank you for joining our Coffee With series. We will be beginning shortly. Let me mute my phone. Okay. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody to the fifth in the coffee series created by the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. I'm Reggie Lewis, the center's executive director, and it's great to greet you from our campus here in South Orange, New Jersey. Uh, the coffee series provides an opportunity to showcase uh, the inspirational stories of servant leaders. Each of our guests has deepen our understanding of the premise of this leadership philosophy and the endless ways in which individuals, organizations, and society in general can be transformed for the better. And I assure you, our guest today will not disappoint. Since 2019, Maria Viscaranto has served as the president and CEO of the Council of New Jersey Grantmakers. She brings a wealth of experience to this role. Her immediate past position entailed her work as the inaugural executive director of the Cabrini University's Nerny Leadership Institute. Maria served in the administration of Newark Mayor Cory Booker, heading up Newark's efforts to advance the quality of health and human services across the city. And in that capacity, she secured state funding for establishing family success centers launched a major citywide campaign to raise immunization rates for Newark's children and developed a children's bill of rights. I believe uh, New, Jersey's, Newark's, uh, New Jersey's largest city was the first uh, to actually produce a children's bill of rights. Prior to her service to the city of Newark, Maria served as the first woman president and CEO of the United Way of Essex and West Hudson where her impact was felt throughout Greater Newark and the state of New Jersey. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, she led the New Jersey United Ways in managing the distribution of corporate funding and a coordination of services for families affected by this tragedy. She earned her BA in political science and sociology at Kane University and a master's in public policy and administration at Columbia University, named one of the 100 most influential people in New Jersey. Maria remains among the state's most prominent thought leaders today. But before we begin, a quick word about the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership here at Seton Hall. Uh, we were founded in 1964, and for well over 50 plus years, the center has worked to promote the understanding awareness and practice of servant leadership, a philosophy in which the leader first seeks to serve. The center's portfolio includes four signature programs, including our Greenleaf Academy, which supports professionals in deepening their foundational knowledge about servant leadership, our Greenleaf Scholars Program, which supports research, the annual public policy lecture, which convenes thought leaders and issue experts and we're uh, deeply proud about our new initiative, 
the Next Generation Initiative, which exposes high school students to the principles of servant leadership. Learn more about our programs by visiting us at greenleaf.org. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about ways in which you can become involved with our center. But let's begin. Maria, have you got your coffee? Yes, I are you, do. Are you ready to go? <laughs> I have my coffee right here. All right. So good. Cup. So good to see you. So good uh, to have you with us today. So, and, uh, so honored to be here. All right. And I love that Blue Council for New Jersey grant maker backdrop. Um, <laughs> hey. um, let's begin with our first question. So BA in poli sci, MA in public policy. It feels to me that you identify with servant leadership early on. Am I wrong? No, not at all. Actually, I feel that being of service has is been part of who I am since I was a child. Mm -hmm. I was born and grew up in East Harlem in New York in an area that was called a barrio. And my mother was of service to, you know, it was the kind of neighborhoods when you had neighborhoods. And my mother was always helping individuals as poor, especially as the Puerto Rican migration started to happen into the New York area. We were the place where you could always get a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, when you first came from Puerto Rico, we had a number of relatives and friends that would stay over with us. So they got their own apartment. And my mother was almost like a uh, employment service because she would take people to her job that's when the garment industry was very mm -hmm. large and she would take them to work with her and they almost always got a job. <laughs> and then whoever was not working served as like the community day daycare center to take care of the children that weren't in school. So I grew up seeing uh, service as this part of life. Wonderful. Um... Obviously your mom inspired you, but um, perhaps if you could name a few more of your heroes and heroines. Sure, well, my mother was number one mm -hmm. because she was an amazing woman who with a second grade education and knowing no English came to the States and navigated how to survive in that system with three daughters. Um, and one of the things I'm very proud of is that all of us ended up going to college and now our children have gone to college. So that's the legacy that she leaves. So she was an amazing woman in her own right. But other people, it's interesting. One of my first heroes was a woman by the name of Miss Carito, who was my third grade teacher, who used to tell me, you know, Maria, you could, you're very smart. You're very inquisitive. Because of course I was all asking all these questions. And, and um, she goes, that's a really good trait to have. Uh, and what she did was, what I think she did most for me was expose me to things that at that age, as a little kid, I never got exposed to. She took me to my first museum. Mm. She took me to my first diner to have a hamburger, which I had never had. Mm. And she took me to her house. She mm. lived in Riverdale. And what I liked about that experience that I still remember is that I went to her house and she had this amazing chandelier in a dining room. Now I lived in a tenement building, but I, I, I was staring at it. And I remember her looking at me and saying, Maria, you see all of this here? You, you're gonna have more this and more because I really think you're gonna be a successful person. So she's someone, I thought about her a lot lately because I was a, a, an, ex, an ex, uh, impression of someone when I was in the third grade that really showed me different you know, opportunities. Then some of the other people in my life, one of the key people in my life as, as I got older was Winona Lippman, oh, yeah. our late Senator, who was just an amazing individual, a woman. And she helped me, she was probably my political mentor mm -hmm. to understand how to navigate in those waters. Mm -hmm. So she was very good at doing that. And I miss her to this day. We still need more women like that in the uh, in the legislature. And she was one of the few women in there. Yeah, and yeah. then another woman was, I was lucky enough because I sort of came up in the cusp of things. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to the YWC of the USA, my first job out of graduate school and worked at the Center for Social, um, um, 
for Racial Justice, which had been started by um, Dorothy Height. Yeah. So I got a chance to be impressed and meet her. And during that experience, also got to spend time with Coretta Scott King wow. and Betty Shabazz and these women that you read about and really got to appreciate two things that they were not only amazing women, but it really gave me uh, an understanding of how the role that women played in the civil rights movement and the work that went on that we never heard about. Mm -hmm. And when you start, I could talk about that for hours, but I won't, because I know you want to move on to the next question. But I think those are, I've been blessed. Oh, and Antonia Pantoja, ah. who founded Aspira. Oh, yes. And Aspira, if it hadn't been for Aspira, I wouldn't even have thought about going to college mm -hmm. because at school, it was hard enough trying to get through school uh, and just didn't think about it, but that organization helped to teach me that, yes, people that look like me do go to college, yes. <laughs> and you could be one of those, and she started this organization in, in the early, like, early 60s in New York City, and that organization has been, uh, was, it was a nation builder. You ended up having a major movement around the women that she and the other women that were part of that. So those are some of the, the people that had a great, imp I would say were some of my uh, heroes or, or I should say heroines because I don't even think I mentioned any men. <laughs> I guess I should mention one. You, but you left us out, yes. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have, but I thought, I've thought of, uh, those are the ones that first come to mind and probably yes. had the greatest impact on me in my life. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and what an amazing, list of of mentors um and heroes and heroines beginning with mom of course mm -hmm. um and obviously they've they influence you and your ability to create and manifest change and so my next question i'm thinking about the range of organizations and institutions that you've been associated with so talk with us about um how your theory of change and transformation evolved as you um, handled the various roles and responsibilities throughout your journey? So I mentioned that I started my professional career at the YWC of the USA. Before I went to, before I, and through my college years, I was involved doing a lot of community organizing work from the time I finished high school through my years in college. But that experience, I left there and went and became the director of Aspira in New Jersey. And, and I've always had an organizational leadership role from that point on. But the point I wanna make that I think is more relevant uh, to this question is in every episode of change that I had in my life, I always felt I was at the cusp of change. Mm -hmm. I went into the YWCA when there was a lot of work being done around racial justice mm -hmm. and the ERA movement to try to really bring equality to women and to also really dealing with the issues of integrating YWCAs, which in many communities were still very segregated, right? Yes. So I was part of that movement. And when I left there and came to uh, the United, the Aspida, that was the years that you started to see the conversation about Abbott versus Burke. Yes. Remember that experience? Yes. Well, we ended up in my role as one of the friends of the court with that case. So I just was kind of like rolled into um, that. The other thing I wanted to mention that wasn't organizational though, I also benefited from some of the um, social changes that were happening at that time. For instance, I was one of the first students in New Jersey, because by that time I lived in this state, to go into the equal uh, the educational opportunity program. Pro EOF, yeah. EOF, which to me is always like, I will always sing their praises because they made it possible for us to have the funds and the and the support to make it through through college. And yes. to me, that was, and I'm glad they're still around. And I think you can't ever say enough about that organization. But my point was that I happened to roll into 
uh, situations where the cusp of change was happening and I embraced it everywhere I went. So I went on to, uh, in my work at, while I was at the YWC, I had still at uh, Aspira and started at the United Way. Mm -hmm. um, we started, I, I worked with a lot of exciting people that were looking at, well, what kinds of change, what kinds of things do we need to keep doing in our community uh, to support that community? And one of the things that came out of that was the creation of the Institute for, for Social Justice. Yeah which I'm very proud of and a uh, shout out to Ryan Hager, one of the best uh, civil rights lawyers that we have right now. Absolutely. But being there in the early days and, and having the opportunity again to see change and be part of that change when it happened. In there, working with the Hispanic Women's Task Force, we were able to see opportunities for women, of, uh, women uh, Latina women that were single women the creation of the uh, involved with the uh, Latinas United for Political Empowerment, which saw from the work we did in there, the first Latina women getting elected to um, statewide office. Mm -hmm. And all of those were things that developed from just being in those moments where change was ripe and, you, and I embraced it every mm -hmm. opportunity I could. So let me stop there because I could do a whole hour on just talking about those kinds of changes. Yeah, that's that's the um, downsides of having a wonderful guest like Maria Viscaranto. We only have an hour. Um, but bring speaking, me for, bring me back for a class series. Oh, we will bring you back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but speaking of embracing the moment, um, you were appointed the first woman and Latina president and CEO of the United Way of Essex and West Hudson. What did your presence do for the United Way movement around the country, not just in New Jersey, but around the country? So I was one of the few, I, there was like, you could count them on less than a hand, mm -hmm. Latina women that were heading up United Ways in the country. So that was a, you know, I've always been, which is the other thing I want to say, I've always been a first. <laughs> I've always been the first. So I say that instead of saying a token, right. because I, I always feel that saying the word token is not only demoralizing, but it, it, it's, it senses, it, 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 it gives the opinion that you have no power, you're just there <laughs> uh, for window dressing. And I've never been a window dresser. So I've been a first in that job. But one of the things I was very proud of that also was in the winds of change my particular United Way, we got very involved in moving the United Way from that model of being a, a campaign uh, manager, a workplace campaign manager, to really looking at the fact that we had this, this enormous uh, depth of um, network of people with influence, mm -hmm. and how do we leverage that to really have greater impact in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we moved from being an organization that was a fundraising entity into a community building organization mm -hmm. that looked at what are the issues in our community and how do we take some of our resources, collaborate with other people and build, uh, build a, a, a community that the results aren't so much what is the final number on your uh, thermometer, remember the, yes. you know, oh, the way yeah. thermometer. forget <laughs> the thermometer, let's talk about how many lives that we save, how many yes. children were vaccinated, how many people were able to get and stay in recovery, Yes, which is one of our major issues, just really looking at that. And I have to tell you, when I started that journey, I would go to national meetings and everybody would be bragging about how they broke their numbers in their campaign. And I would get up there and I'd say, no, I'm I, I am thrilled to report to you that a thousand children's lives were improved because we could get them into daycare. Yes. So many people were able to survive and get the medications they need because we helped to organize that with other leaders. So I just changed the dynamics of the conversation and it was way after I left, if you listen now to where United Ways talk, the way they talk, 
the conversation isn't about that thermometer that thermometer. In fact, in New Jersey, the conversation is what they call Alice, which you may be familiar with, hmm. which is looking at how do we help to to um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Stabilize the life of that middle class family who, if they lose two dollars, yes, they're totally they're in the street. They can't pay their mortgage. Really focusing on 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 indicators that have an impact on the lives of Alice's. So it's a different conversation, and I'm thrilled and honored to have been part of that change in that conversation. And full disclosure to our guests, I was uh, thrilled and honored, honored to be mentored by Maria um, as her vice president for community impact um, when That's I had right. a whole lot more hair. Um, and, I taught you uh, everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> everything I know, particularly around the, the whole notion of, of impact and the value of collaboration. So when you were talking about bringing folk around the table, you brought back visions of the vision councils mm -hmm. in which all United Way grantees were essentially required to be a part of, of that process. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, what a wonderful time in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I wanna ask about um, uh, another part of history, an unfortunate part of our history um, today, as we all know, marks the, the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And Maria, as a founding member of the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, what are your thoughts about policing reforms, reestablishing trust between marginalized communities and law enforcement? Um, how are you thinking about these kinds of issues today? Obviously, this was something that broke my heart. Um, I've known so many George Floyds. I grew mm -hmm. up in a community full of George Floyds. So that was like losing a brother in mm -hmm. that sense because you could so identify with the situation. So here's, here's what I've always tried to do with those situations. I've tried to see where can I, as a person, be of service or help to have an impact in that situation. So one of the things that I wanna give a shout out as a matter of fact, to my old hometown of Newark, New Jersey, our mayor there has been persistent and finally won to have what is basically a citizens review board. Yes. Um, a department now there, which met with a lot of uh, um, pushback, especially from the police unions has now happened. And the thing is that I truly believe that in order to change the way police look at us, because if you look at history and that's the problem, you have to look at historically how the whole concept of the police even form. And I don't know if a lot of your students may know this, but the police was originally uh, put together almost like a vigilante group mm -hmm. to bring back slaves that ran away. Mm -hmm. And so it police started off with uh, 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 an identity of capturing, of hurting, yeah. mm -hmm. of creating, um, putting people in their place. Ver so, versus protecting and serving. <laughs> exactly. That protection was never there. Uh, and serving, that was never the agenda. So through the years, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else. Well, we not guilty. I felt at one point that what we needed to do was to make sure that there were enough police uh, in our communities that looked like us, that spoke our language. And originally that plan I think was a good one, but what happens is once you get into that police force, they police will even say they bleed blue, they speak a different language, they just get usurped into that culture. We have to do two things. You have to have a civ civ civilian groups that can oversee or not control what's going on, but can see what's going on and have some control of how police act in their communities. And number two, and this may sound really simple, but let's look at that curriculum that they're offering in the police departments and incorporate more uh, psychology into it. Let's talk about real techniques to defuse situations. Yes. And, um, 
very importantly, do some real um, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work with individuals, with individuals in there. Because the, I think part of the issue is that there's this understanding that if you're a person of color, uh, police have to somehow protect the world from you. Right. And you may do the same thing. I, I'll never forget, when was it when that gentleman, that guy Root, whose last name was Root, killed all those people in the, in the church? Right. That he went and shot them. When the cops apprehended him, they took him to Burger King and fed him some Burger King on their uh, way to the police department. If that happened any of us, mm. there'd be no Burger King in that conversation. Exactly. You know. So the issue is learning to look at everybody from a different lens, mm -hmm. doing it through a lens of racial equity. Mm -hmm. So that's what's got to happen. You got to have that that going on in the academy, and you've got to have folks on the outside that are constantly championing their, their community as well. Absolutely. It's a complicated situation. It's not easy, mm -hmm. but I think if we persevere, uh, just like in Newark, they persevere to have that um, that that department now. Yes. Uh, that's what it takes and you can never ease up on it. That's right. Um, you're referring to um, the civilian complaint review or some form of a civilian complaint yeah, review board, which yeah, helps yeah, to ensure yeah. accountability. Um, exactly. When you consider, um, I should say, whether you consider the tragedy of Mr. Floyd, the economic uncertainty, uh, the fallout tied to uh, the pandemic, and, and well over a half a million Americans who've lost their lives, doesn't this really validate that leadership matters, that empathic leadership is essential, whether in a crisis or not? Absolutely, absolutely. And I have to tell you, uh, just to say, I, I, I focused on George Floyd because of the immediacy of that situation. But let me tell you what's happening institutionally uh, to try to deal with that situation. First of all, as, uh, as you know, I'm president of the Council of New Jersey grant makers. And what that is, if I could take a minute to explain, is kind of the, the center for <clears throat> all the foundations in New Jersey, whether it's a Robert Wood Johnson or if it's um, a small uh, family foundation, they come together and they're able to, we make opportunities for them to collaborate, to learn more about trends in philanthropy and to find ways to work effectively in philanthropy in the area of philanthropy. And over this past year, we developed, we created or convened all of the, the or all of the foundations that had the pandemic funds. Yes. And we would meet with them weekly. We would talk about here's where there's gaps, uh, where there's a need for service for marginalized individuals. We started to have training opportunities and, and web, webinars around racial equity and supporting all of our foundations that were starting to do a lot more work on that particular subject. In particular, I wanna, I wanna mention the Dodge Foundation, which over the last five years has really looked at how do we deal with the power dynamic of a foundation and make them more willing to work in partnership with nonprofits mm -hmm because at the end of the day, nonprofits know best how to do serve the community. And our job is to provide the resources to make that happen. And to eliminate that power dynamic that says, well, you know, you may be a small storefront that is helping communities, but we still want you to do these major evaluation uh, indicators uh, to keep your proposal, to keep getting funding, you know, to get some of that dynamic out of the way so we could really look at how do you take individuals uh, and take situations and make change. So we've, we, we've been very involved in that. We have started now within our organization, we have a racial equity task force. And that task force is helping to put together over this next couple of years, um, a blueprint for equity within our organizations. 
within our membership organizations, hopefully. And what do I mean by that? Hiring more people of color within the foundations, uh, looking at recruiting more people of color onto the boards of the foundations, and very importantly, supporting organizations, nonprofit organizations that are led by people of color at greater numbers, and also trying to eliminate whatever obstacles we tend to put in their way to, to their success. So we have a lot of work that we're engaged in right now. And again, like I, I, I said earlier, and I think that it's, it's my fate, I tend to end up in places where change is gonna happen. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm sad to have to say this, but George Floyd's death put such a spark into this particular philanthropic movement in New Jersey that I think would have taken longer for us to move in that direction mm -hmm. with just Maria Viscarando talking about it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we had to see something like that happen to really make people realize that we need to, it was a call to action. And so we're gonna see that and we'll continue to see that I think over the next, we will have to see it for the next number of years because this is really, if I have to tell you, if I have to say this 20 times, I will, it is the hardest work we'll ever do in this country. And we all have to do our part. We certainly do. And again, kudos to you and all your colleagues at the council for using or leveraging the tragedy to be catalytic in accelerating change that we've all been talking about uh, for some time, particularly in terms of the dynamic between funder and grantee. Mm -hmm. um, just curious, just one follow-up on that, if you could just say a bit more about the ways in which grant makers are helping to support leadership and capacity building efforts in particular among their grantees across the state. Um, th the value for leadership. Well, th that's been there. Uh, there's a number of things going on. First of all, a number of the foundations are supporting efforts that are uh, creating leadership, uh, um, leadership programs, whether it's mentorships or training programs for people of color who are right now in leadership positions to help to number one, help them network, help them get their foot in the door. Uh, we're hoping to see more, more mentorships where uh, people of color can come and work within the foundations but with a real sense of permanency. You know, in the past, we've had a variety of, of um, mentorships out there or internships. Yes. And they never land. They're a great working experience, but they didn't result in a permanent change in that organization. Mm -hmm. We're hoping now that the efforts will, re, 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 um, will result in the change in organizations. And this has to happen. And let me tell you specifically why this has to happen. If you've been keeping up with some of the statistics and I'm not crazy about statistics, but I do look at them uh, periodically to see what's coming down the pike. Yes. And I guess that's what keeps me in the, in the cusp. All the statistics are telling us that by 2040, people of color are gonna be the majority of people in this country. Mm -hmm. That means that people of color have to be equipped and able and ready to replace, in many cases, people of color, uh, white individuals that are retiring. That's the first part of it. But the other part of it is, and this is where the leadership part comes in play, we need to start grooming people of color, the next generations, the millennials and the, what's the ones that come after millennials? The Gen, I, 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 Gen Ys or whatever. I get the I get the letters confused myself. That's why okay. I have that Z. That's why you have young there, people there working just with you. gave me the 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 hint uh, Z. So yes, the Z. The <laughs> next is the G. We have to help them learn to be leaders. Yes. Learn leadership. Learn empathy. They need to learn. Um, have a sense of self awareness where they can really figure out how to work with people. They need to develop skills of persuasion. Yes. 
And all the, in fact, I'm giving you probably the, the, um, all the, the points of the servant leader that Mr. Greenleaf uh, developed, Absolutely. but we have to make sure that they learn those because that's what's gonna help them to make that move from uh, into leadership roles. And why is that important? Because we know that being a leader, uh, leadership in the future is gonna mean not just when it comes to DEI, it's not just gonna mean making sure that there's people of color, the BIPOCs as we're saying now, everywhere, but that they're also in roles of leadership. Yes. Absolutely. Otherwise, otherwise, nothing's going to change. Since you've um, enlightened us a bit about DEI, I've got one final question before we move into our Q&A portion. Um, how can the focus on DEI be used to maximize ways to create more inclusive environments without sharpening lines of division? Well, first of all, I don't like to use the term DEI anymore. Okay, all right. <laughs> because it's um, the inclusive part I do like. But one of the issues is it's becoming a, a buzzword. Yes. Just like affirmative action was a buzzword before or tokenism, which I really hate, was a buzzword for a while that everybody had to have their token. The issue now is how do we, how do we help all people understand our history and not be ashamed of what happened in the past, but learn from it. Take that history and make sure we don't repeat it. We don't repeat it when we try to be less exclusive. Like I mentioned with foundations, if they break down the power dynamics, it helps you to be more inclusive of others that are not part of the conversation uh, uh, at the present. So you, you want to have that as part of it. And that, I think, carries a major role in the work we have to do. And it just, well, the, uh, a lot of companies are using that term ESG, okay. which is really their way of dealing with uh, um, inclusion and diversity. E ESG, and, the acronym is for? Uh, what is it again? Environment, social, and governance. Yes. So those, uh, those terms are looking at how we do business, which makes a lot of sense. The companies are getting it. There's, it's like you've seen companies go from uh, recognizing that if they're gonna sell their products, the, the, a lot of our companies, they're gonna sell their products because they actually have people that look like the consumer to go and, and, uh, and take part in, in, uh, in the business. So the business community has learned that you need to have people included, not only as faces of the product, but also to help to define how that product is going to resonate with different communities. And so we have to do the same thing. During this pandemic, the Council of Foundations put together a list of, uh, of uh, what did they call it? They put together a list of, of requirements that every foundation was going to follow. And to make it, and it was done to really help to expedite the ability to give dollars out during this pandemic. And some of them are really ones that we should keep. One of them was let's eliminate all the red tape that keeps foundations from being able to apply for money. Let's go out and into these communities and meet these organizations that are helping to support our community, not wait for them to just come to our and knock on our door. That's just an example of some of the things of the power dynamic piece that has made exclusivity exist. So going back to your question about the inclusiveness, it's dealing with those issues of power. It's understanding that you're there to serve yes. as opposed to control what people do that starts changing uh, how people look at it. So it's more an issue of how do we get to an inclusive society? Absolutely. Uh, serving versus controlling. Um, we're going to uh, ask a member of my team, Walter, to now share questions that are coming into our chat feed. So we're in our Q&A portion. Walter? Mm-hmm. 
All right, so the first question we have is, first the person uh, thanked Maria for sharing their backgrounds, uh, her background story, and they asked if there was a piece of advice, uh, wisdom, or a quote that you live by. Yes, I do. And in fact, I have it on my, if you get an email from me, you know how you should have people, their person's banner, uh, it'll have your name, whatever. And then some people put a quote. Well, I keep that quote there so I can look at it every day. And it's Mahatma Gandhi's quote about be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. I live by that. I really try to, that's where the empathy comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding, um, recognizing, being aware of what you're saying to people and being and, and making sure that that awareness results in something always having empower, uh, empowering and impeccable words to share with people. It's a great question. Uh, Walter, next one, and, and um, there are some audio issues. So maybe if you could speak up a little bit, please. Walter. Sorry about that. As of right now in the chat, I don't see any more questions or in the Q&A feature. Okay. Um, so that gives us a little bit more time, Maria, to um, I saw, sip I our cap. I saw something, I saw something that looks like a question from Natasha Dyer. Okay. Walter. It's more from, put like a statement, but I think it's a question. Yeah. Uh, she says, uh, and the DEI doesn't speak to fostering a sense of belonging for uh, BIPLC staff members. Exactly, and I agree with that. That's why I was saying I don't even use that term anymore, DEI, because I think it limits where people people's thinking, and it's less about inclusiveness as much. I think it's become a statement that creates more like window dressing. Yes. Which doesn't help, there's nothing empowering about that. The only people that get empowered in those situations, and I have to put myself in that category, mainly because what I've tried to do, when I mentioned before, I try to embrace opportunities. I take those, those situations when I'm the only one or the first, and I always tell myself, I have a tremendous responsibility to bring other people with me. And so how do I manage this? Or how do I work, navigate this opportunity to leverage chance uh, opportunities for other people to come and follow and continue to come? But I'll tell you something else about that. And now that I'm much older, uh, it's, it's a very trying um, process for any individual. It's a big responsibility. Uh, you can never give it up, but it's like my mother said, too much is given, much is expected. It becomes a labor, a definite labor uh, overall. So uh, Let, let's, let's ex expound on that because um, there, there are, there's that perspective that um, individuals of color who have reached or achieved some degree of success should assume that responsibility, that burden to educate us all. Um, and yet it, it is exhausting. It is a burden. Um, say more about how you and how, how all of us should um, think about self-care um, as we stay on that journey of bringing everyone along because it is a journey and not something that we can arrive at overnight. Thank you for saying that. And if anything, this pandemic helped us to understand that. I have known people in my life who are incredible community leaders. Uh, and I remember as a very young child that committed suicide, mm. that took to drinking, uh, that basically hurt themselves in their own need to feel uh, to self-medicate because they recognize the, the weight that they have put on themselves. I tell all young leaders, you have to always, always take care of yourself. You need to have some kind of spiritual connection. If you're not religious, spiritualism in the sense of have some meditation, have some ways that you can expound your energy and reinforce and and give yourself a sense of um, you, 
you just, you have to love yourself, show yourself self love. Mm -hmm. And you do that through meditation. You do that by always stopping. And I've done that. I will, I take four vacations a year. Okay. Four. <laughs> four, not one, four <laughs> vacations a year. Quarterly, I try to go away or something. And the reason I do that is because I know I need to recharge. Mm -hmm. And when I get recharged, I come back and I do more things. Mm -hmm. But you have to allow yourself to do that. It's like, you know, they have that analogy about if you're ever with a, with a child on a, pl on a plane and you lose the oxygen, what do they tell you? You have to get the oxygen for yourself first in order to be able to take care of other people. You always have to be into self-care. Whether it's, like I said, meditation, it's spending time away by yourself, it's going for a massage, it's going for, for uh, a swim, something that you feel will give you strength and, and uh, re-energize you. Because otherwise it can become, you can't find yourself in a situation that is detrimental. Absolutely. Um... Before we close out, Walter, any other questions in our queue? Uh, we have, how do nonprofits break through to collaborate with philanthropic groups when funding is limited for new groups due to focus on the pandemic? So, so Walter, just one more time and slightly louder. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, how do nonprofits break through to collaborate with philanthropic groups when funding is limited for new groups due to focus on the pandemic? Find out, well, for instance, in, in New Jersey, if you talk about New Jersey, we have a variety of affinity groups that we work with and the foundations participate in those opportunities. We just had two weeks ago, our spring conference, which was called, very interestingly enough, the future of work. Hmm. Um, and we have opportunities for the nonprofits to work with us in uh, to attend those conference, those events and get to know some of the funders. The other thing you should know is that our council, the Council of New Jersey Grant Makers, basically is tied to the hip to the Center for Nonprofits, hmm. which is the, 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 the center for all nonprofits in New Jersey. We are constantly doing a joint programming and through, through those two vehicles, there's opportunities to be able to touch base with, um, with other funders uh, to participate. And you also know that from the pandemic, there's the New Jersey Pandemic Fund, which has supported uh, many of the foundations in the area. So I would look at whatever town you're from, look to see uh, what foundations are in that area and, can, and make that connection between that foundation and the uh, the, the New Jersey pandemic. Great, great question. Um, and unfortunately, our time is uh, rapidly coming to a close. I did say to you all that Maria would not disappoint. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Maria, for giving us much needed motivation and inspiration today. Um, New Jersey is indeed a better place because of your journey of service. And so we thank you and we invite all of our guests to give you that huge virtual round of applause. Thank you um, for having me. I'm honored. <laughs> um, and we are going to have you back. <laughs> I'd love to come back. Um, I love working with students. Um, and, 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 and hopefully here on campus. Um, so before I go, just a few updates uh, on center activities. Um, registration is still open for uh, the International Servant Leaders Summit. Uh, which takes place next month, June 9th through the 11th. Find out more by visiting servantleadersummit.org. Um, if you're interested in honing your skills as a leader, you can attend one of our Greenleaf Academy classes. Uh, visit us at greenleaf.org. We have a course uh, coming up on June 4th on the foundations of servant leadership. We have our June 17th course on key practices of servant leadership. And we certainly hope to see you next month when we'll be hosting Joe Patterncheck, uh, former chair of the Greenleaf Center Board and former head of HR for the Cleveland Clinic. Thanks so much again for being with us today. 
Maria, we love you. And we'll see everyone next month. Take good care. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.